Welcome to Citizens Climate Radio. In this podcast, we highlight people's stories, we celebrate your successes, and together we share strategies for talking about climate change. I'm your host, Peterson Toscano. Welcome to Episode 6 of Citizens Climate Radio, a project of Citizens Climate Education. This episode is airing on Monday, November 28th, 2016. Hello and welcome. In addition to our normal show today, I actually have a special treat for you in this episode. Earlier this month, I traveled to Washington, D.C. with over 300 volunteer lobbyists for the Citizens Climate Congressional Education Days. This was less than a week after the U.S. presidential election. We entered the Congressional and Senate office buildings on Capitol Hill and spoke with hundreds of members of Congress and their staffs about climate solutions. At the end of today's program, some folks will share experiences and some wisdom for the days ahead. In the Art House, you will hear a story, a whimsical theory written by a science professor. I will also share your answers to our monthly puzzler question, and I present a particularly tricky new puzzler question for you to answer. But first, we have our main section. I sat down with Natasha Dejanet, a policy analyst who looks at environmental health. In this conversation, we talk about health and climate, including mental health issues stirred up during extreme weather. Natasha reveals the very real health risks we face on a changing planet. She also explains how she sees positive opportunities. Natasha works out of Washington, D.C. for the American Public Health Association. I met her in June at the Citizens Climate International Conference. I began our interview by asking why she came to the conference. I'm here because APHA wants to help people understand the connections between climate change and health. The face of climate change has largely been the polar bear, and we've got to get beyond the polar bear. That's important. Don't get me wrong. The polar bear and the impacts on the polar bear and nature are quite important, but those impacts also impact human health, particularly our vulnerable populations, our children, our elderly. Those that contribute the least towards climate change are those that are impacted the greatest by it. So we've got to be the voice for those vulnerable populations and all populations. So there's been a lot of white polar bear power and privilege that we need to address. Um, (laughs) So, you know, like I think a lot of people, they hear climate change, they do think of polar bears, or they think of scientists, or they think of political debate, but they don't typically think of health issues. Exactly. So talk a little bit about some of these health issues in climate change. Well, there are many health impacts of climate change. Unfortunately, we can start with air quality impacts. That's uh, um, a large deal coming out of climate change. Uh, With climate change, we'll have more air pollution. We're also going to have longer and possibly more potent pollen seasons. So this is going to expose us to more allergens, triggering more allergies and asthma. Um, And that particularly will affect our children at greater um, risk than our adults. There are also impacts on extreme weather. We're emitting more CO2. This is trapping heat towards the Earth's surface, and this is causing the warmer temperature, but this is also causing more energy to be trapped, and this is what's causing our increases in storms and severe weather. So with this comes extreme rainfall, and this leads to flooding. This causes injuries and illness, but also can contribute to the spread of infectious diseases um, through waterborne transmission. So we've got the flooding, then we have increased storms. So you see things like Superstorm Sandy, and you see Hurricane Katrina, and these extreme storms that are causing extreme destruction and devastation, and that also causes injury and illness. And I also want people to take time to focus on the mental illness impacts there. So people are getting displaced from their homes. People are dealing with anxieties and post-traumatic stress associated with the what happens during these storms. So that's another important um, health outcome that comes out of this. So we've got these extreme storms. We've got um, air quality impacts. We also have increases in vector-borne diseases. Um, And that's going to be particularly important as we go into this summer with the threat of Zika virus. But there's already been a large threat of viruses going on. In Maine, in 20 years ago, they only had about a dozen cases of Lyme disease. 
Now they have over 1,100 cases of Lyme disease. Well, that was actually in 2012. It's likely gone up since then. The, the reason being is that Maine now has an environment that's hospitable to these um, insects and vectors, um, ticks in particular carrying Lyme disease, but it's West Nile virus in New York. It's not just Lyme disease, it's not just West Nile disease, and it's not only going to be Zika. There are so many health impacts of climate change. You know, the insect thing and the pollen wear me out because I, I mean, you know, I'm not a super nature kind of guy, but I do. Mm-hmm. Like in the other, like about a month, two months ago, it was still spring. I wanted to have a little Walt Whitman moment out in the woods and sort of lay out in the grass. Mm-hmm. And my my seasonal allergies were acting up, mm-hmm. and then I was like terrified that like a tick would bite me. And I was mm-hmm. like, you know what? Forget this. Yeah. And I went back in the car. And <laughs> it's it's really it's unfortunate that. We can't enjoy nature the way we once wanted to, whether it's that nature is being destructed and that nature doesn't look the way it once did. The coral reef color has changed. The Arizona River is drying up, for example. You know, we, we can't enjoy nature the way we once wanted to, and then we're attacked by vectors in the process. It's, it's really unfortunate. And the other large health contributor for climate change is extreme heat. And that's what people seem to be very familiar with, the extreme heat. But it cannot be taken lightly. Heat strokes can actually lead to death if untreated. 2015, no, 2014 might have been the warmest on record. Then came 2015, the warmest on record. Now we're um, into 2016, and um, heat waves and heat-related illnesses will be something that the public health community and the greater community at large needs to be prepared for so that we can be more resilient and be able to adapt to the health effects of climate change. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, in these extreme heat events, it's the, the most vulnerable are the very youngest and exactly. the oldest. Exactly. Very young, very oldest. And then you also have to consider people um, that are socioeconomically disadvantaged. So they may not have air conditioning. Um, and air conditioning is actually the top way to prevent heat-related illness. And they may not have it, and they may not have access to it. Some cities across the U.S. and some communities across the U.S. have done a really good job of creating cooling centers where people can go to cool off. Making sure the community knows that these facilities are available, or a mall, or other things that people can access publicly and and for free. Making sure that the community knows that these are available is very important, because some will stay at home and deal with it, and particularly our elders. Um, We need to certainly make sure to check on our neighbors. For me, I've never seen myself as an environmentalist. Mm -hmm. So I didn't think I had skin in the game until I saw all the justice issues. Yes. And so, like, I like what you're saying, that, like, yes, there are things that we can do to address climate change, but there's very practical, in-the-moment stuff we can do, but that the upside, too, is it builds community. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And building community is great for our health. All around, not just in terms of climate change, but in terms of our overall health, people that are more connected have longer life expectancy. So if in the climate change movement we can build um, more resilient communities by more connected communities, I'm all for it. Now, I know that there hasn't been a lot of studies yet done, but they're in the works around mental health and climate yes. change. Mm-hmm. But one thing that they've definitely seen is marginalized communities, indigenous communities mm-hmm. who are already stressed, right. but the added stress of extreme weather creates a lot of distress, and they're seeing an uptick of suicides of drug addiction Mm -hmm. and substance abuse, and that they're even saying that after a traumatic event, which is an extreme weather, the effects can last for years. It's awful. Absolutely awful. Are are there any best practices yet out there for mental health practitioners to, to what to do in a time of climate change, of how to address this kind of climate Mm change-induced emotional distress? Mm -hmm. Well, one problem is that mental health conditions are marginalized. And so these conditions aren't necessarily part of the mainstream discussions, and people tend to shun mental health as, oh, they just need to better handle their emotions. So one, stopping the marginalization of that will help a lot. Getting this conversation out more in the front, front, forefront will help a lot. I, I can't tell you how many times I've talked about the mental health impacts of climate change, 
and seeing shotgun people's faces. But then when they think about Hurricane Katrina and the media coverage and what they saw and what people were exposed to and how that would have lasting mental health impacts, our director, Dr. Terry Wright, frequently tells us a story about children that were affected by Hurricane Katrina and how now every time a storm warning comes on TV, they're showing post-traumatic stress effects because they're expecting to see something like Hurricane Katrina all over again. So addressing this is very important. Getting these conversations out more in the open is in the forefront and not shaming people about the mental health impacts. Although I'm in public health and I, APHA is the voice for public health, physicians are often the first responders when it comes to any of the climate change health impacts because physicians are likely to see their patients once or more a year. And physicians may want to take some time to evaluate this about their patients or inform this of their patients. If they're in a community that has gone through some severe traumatic climate event, a tornado or a hurricane or superstorm, for example, when the patient's back in, following up with them on how this has impacted them mentally as well as physically, of course, as well. This is an exciting time to be in the field of climate change. Certainly not exciting that climate change is happening, but there is much opportunity and many gains. And simply over the past year, attention towards this as a health outcome has really ramped up, starting with the Lancet report last year. And then the Pope said, you know, this is a moral issue. Clean water was a huge opportunity. Imagine the years of life expectancy that we've gained from having clean water. Think about our life expectancy before vaccination and after. And so now we have climate change and we've got this great opportunity and we can help improve health, extend lives, and improve quality of life by addressing it. It's a win-win at the end of the day. We just need to highlight the benefits of addressing climate change. I'm so grateful for Natasha's words and the wisdom that she shared. But before I end this section, I have one other voice I'd like to bring into the conversation. A few years ago at the Citizens Climate International Conference, I heard Dr. Jalan White Newsom speak about environmental justice, or EJ for short. Recently at the Pennsylvania Interfaith Power and Light Annual Conference, I heard Dr. White Newsom speak again. Her entire talk was excellent and I wish I could share it with you. Sadly, the recording was not so excellent. It was flu season, and with all the coughing, you would think that we were in a 1930s tuberculosis ward. Still, there is one section of the talk that I want you to hear, because in it, Dr. White Newsom speaks about resiliency. I'm going to give you some academic definitions of resiliency. So, FEMA... The Federal Emergency Management Agency, they define resilience as the ability to adapt to changing conditions and rapidly recover from disruption. All right. The American Psychological Association, a little bit different, describes resilience as a rubber band. So if you imagine a rubber band, you pull it, you put stress on it, but normally if it's a good rubber band, it bounces back. So that's the way they think about resilience. At the foundation, at Cresty, we define resilience as this comprehensive, integrated approach to making sure we're adapting the climate that we're mitigating climate and also building social cohesion, so building tight networks of people that can protect and, and do for each other. And so at Cresty, we don't believe that folks should just kind of bounce back like that rubber band. We believe that people should actually bounce forward. So when you talk about resilience, it's about building stuff better than the way you built it before, not just the same way. So you're dealing with the same stuff, right? You know, I really like that concept, this bouncing forward. And I think that's true for those of us who do climate work, that there's a need to bounce forward. Well, I'm very grateful to Natasha Desjarnet from the American Public Health Association and for Dr. Jalan White Newsom from the Kresge Foundation. I'd love to hear your thoughts about health and climate change. Feel free, send me your comments, radio at citizensclimate.org. That's radio at citizensclimate.org.
Now it is time for the art house. Joining us in the art house is Dr. David R. Bowne, associate professor in the Department of Biology at Elizabethtown College. Using his scientific expertise and tapping into his creative side, David wrote a short story. It's called Henry Ford Hated Glaciers. David will tell us a little bit about the story and then read an excerpt. I wrote Henry Ford Hated Glaciers to have fun with the causes and solutions to climate change. We know increasing greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide, are warming the planet, and much of this increase has happened since the Industrial Revolution. It's the accidental consequence of modernization. In economic terms, it's called a negative externality. But reality is kind of boring. A grand conspiracy theory is much more interesting. And who better to hatch a scheme to warm the planet than our chief architect of industrialization, Henry Ford? I realized I could use an absurd conspiracy theory to motivate consideration of the actual causes of climate change and propose a positive approach to address the problem. The story is unusual as it envisions using the free market to reduce greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere, just as a failure in the free market allowed the increase. It's an oddly optimistic take on a decidedly depressing topic. I hope readers will enjoy the story and be inspired to be creative in seeking new ideas of how to address climate change. Fred reached into his backpack for another book. Jim grabbed it and looked at the title. Combustible Personalities, The Minds Behind Machine Marvels by Montgomery Washington. Sounds exciting, Jim said. Just read it. Reluctantly, Jim turned to the page marked by an old candy wrapper. The chapter began with a straightforward biography, but evolved into an interesting exploration of the personality quirks of his subject. Washington claims that Henry Ford, creator of the Model T, innovator of mass production, hated glaciers. He surmises that Ford didn't hate glaciers because of what they were. The guy wasn't crazy. How can anyone be passionately disturbed by ice? but rather what they did, nothing. Glaciers just sit there covering up perfectly good land. Ford saw it as an affront to his guiding principle of efficiency. He believed it would be much better to take the land hidden under tons of snow and ice and convert it into farmland. Increasing agricultural production was a subject that increasingly obsessed Ford. But Ford, Washington states, was a practical man. He focused on improving the mechanization of farms, not on some chaotic quest to till moraine. Jim sighed as he looked up from the book. Fred, did you bother reading the whole thing? Ford didn't do anything about glaciers. Jim, Jim, Jim. Fred shook his head as he repeated the name. Of course Washington said that. Did you expect him to find Ford taking a blowtorch to Greenland? Think of what the press would have said about that. Ford freaks at fjord. No, if Ford was intent on getting rid of glaciers, he'd be more subtle. Or more interested in making cars than wasting his time on this crap? Now, man, you're missing the point. Fred moved to the window, gesturing towards it, as if imploring his roommate to view deeply the world outside. Ford did both, but only one was obvious. His manufacturing techniques completely revolutionized the world. Ford made cars and other goods affordable for the common man. But he didn't do it for the sake of making stuff or getting rich. He did it to melt glaciers. You've lost me, Fred. Now it was Fred's turn to speak slowly, if not softly. It's simple. Carbon dioxide gets emitted from car exhaust, from the manufacturing process, from massive deforestation to obtain rubber to make tires. Every step puts CO2 into the air and enhances the greenhouse effect. Every step raises the planet's temperature. Every step melts glaciers. Don't you see? Vonnegut was wrong. Stopping glaciers is easy. We don't need an anti-glacier book. We're living it. Fred was getting excited again, fueled by his own voice breathing life into his ideas. Jim closed his eyes and rubbed his temple with his left hand. He couldn't believe he was having this conversation. Fred, you've got to be joking. You're just playing me, right? 
No, man, I'm serious. Ford wanted to destroy glaciers and he succeeded. But that's insane. I mean, Ford couldn't have even known about the greenhouse effect. It was discovered long after his death. No, you're wrong, Fred said with apparent delight. A Swedish chemist named Arianus figured out the basic principles in 1896. The guy later won a Nobel Prize. Someone as knowledgeable as Ford would have read his work. But come on, how could Ford knew what he was doing? He sold cars, got everyone hyped up about mass production, and in the process secretly altered climate and destroyed glaciers. It's brilliant. Everyone helps, but no one knows. Except you. Except me, Fred said as he grinned, then added, And now you. That was David R. Bowne reading Henry Ford Hated Glaciers. If you have an idea for the art house, please feel free to email me, radio at citizensclimate.org. That's radio at citizensclimate.org. We're interested in music, poetry, comedy, so much more. And with that, it's now time for our puzzler. Last month's puzzler came to us from Chris Weingard. How might you respond to the argument that shifting to renewable energy is unrealistic because lower income people are dependent on low energy prices? I received several answers. I share with you one from Sabrina Fu, Mid-Atlantic Co-Regional Coordinator of Citizens Climate Lobby. She writes, quote, We all know that if we put a price on CO2 emissions, the price of most everything will go up since almost all of our goods and services are based upon cheap fossil fuels. The increase in prices with a carbon fee will take a much larger percentage out of poor people's budgets. The solution? equitable distribution of a carbon fee in the form of a monthly dividend check. The monthly dividend check will more than make up for the increase in prices for people in the lower economic brackets, allowing them to not only weather the transition, but with some planning, become less fossil fuel dependent. An example of this would be to use some of the dividend to insulate homes." End quote. Thanks to Sabrina and all the folks who wrote and left messages. Now, let's hear our new puzzler question. No surprise, it has something to do with the recent U.S. presidential election. You are at a community event and people are talking about the historic upset as they speculate on what a Trump presidency will look like. You pipe up, well, as you know, I am concerned about climate change, so I am going to work that much harder to raise awareness and get the government to change energy policy. People laugh. Someone snorts. One says, oh, nothing is going to happen for the next four years. We are back to coal and fossil fuels. Might as well take up a new hobby. So what do you do? How do you respond? How can you share what's in your heart as well as what's in your head? Send me your answers. Leave your name, contact info, and where you are from. Get back to me by December 15th, 2016. You can email your answers to radio at citizensclimate.org. That's radio at citizensclimate.org. You can also text me or leave a voicemail of three minutes or less at 570-483-8194. Plus one, if calling from outside the USA. That number again is 570-483-8194. Before we close out, I promise to share some voices from the Citizens Climate Congressional Education Days. On November 14th and 15th, a week after the presidential election, we gathered to learn how to speak more effectively about climate change. Then we spent a day practicing what we learned on Capitol Hill. I share with you some of the wisdom, insight, and experiences of folks seeking climate solutions. I realized that we have been doing a run-through up until now. That we were pretty comfortable with what we were doing, we were feeling pretty good about what we were doing, we were on a stage we were completely comfortable with. Then our theater burned down. And we have to relocate to a new theater and set the show 
on that new stage and it's showtime and that you, anybody can put on a good show when everything's going well and the measure of a performer uh, how they respond to something that goes wrong lets the audience know if they're prepared they're resilient you know how, how they respond to something like that and I told my group we are prepared and we are resilient I'm 18 years old and most of my time is devoted towards climate action. I'm taking a year off from school and I'm heading back to college next year, but in the meantime I'm doing a lot of climate advocacy work. This will be my third lobbying event. As a millennial, it is the craziest thing you could do. You go into these congressional buildings and you see, honestly, white-haired old men Sometimes you see a young person, you're like, oh my gosh, hi, you and I are alike. And it's just the most powerful thing, going into one of those meetings with a congressional staffer, and they see a young face, you're taking time out of your busy schedules, college schedules, and saying, I care about this subject, and I'm making an effort to tell you about it. It's really powerful. We build everything on the relationship of one human being to another. You know, there's a different skill set that you develop when you're looking to see how you can bring on a relationship with another person. When you're respectful, it doesn't mean you hold people to account for a non-scientific view of the world. You know, yes, we develop, we foster respectful relationships, but also you start with a respect for science. That's always been the basis of our work is First, you have to establish the science is the science. I'm not a scientist. I'm not smart enough to be a scientist, but I'm smart enough to know that you respect what the scientists say. And so you do need to hold people to account that they work in relationship to a scientific standard. So you can't, no matter how much respect you have, you can never let go of that. We could have some kind of a big breakthrough. You know, I don't see where it it's coming from or if it's going to come, but I think that uh, it's certainly possible and some things do come all of a sudden. We can take action in politics. Like a lot of my friends, I guess we're unaware how much control we actually have. I mean, they think of Washington, D.C. as only, it's only adults, and that's all the decisions being made. But it's, it's also our end, the citizens' end. This experience has been absolutely amazing. It's kind of unbelievable uh, walking through the hallways of, of, a, of buildings filled with people that direct what's going on in the country I live in, and uh, that we all live in, and especially fighting for a cause that essentially directs where my future entirely is related upon has been something completely influential. I'd just like to thank every single one of you, um, by the way. You guys are awesome. You guys are absolutely great. And uh, I'd like to give you a round of applause for everyone because honestly, like this, this group of people is, is amazing. The quality of the relationships that you can develop with people that all have a desire to make a livable world is just incredible. I, I, I appreciate every single one of you. So. When you're part of those circles, it can feel really helpless a lot of times. Um, you know, you start to believe that fossil fuel companies are in charge, that lobbyists are in charge, and not people. And today, um, my representative, which is actually Representative uh, Carlos Corbello, uh, I met with his staff, and you know we had a great discussion. And I left the meeting feeling something I hadn't felt in a, in a really long time. And and it was a reminder that you know when you do this kind of work, it really feels helpless. It feels like we're not in charge. And today, for the first time in a while, I felt citizens, you and I, are actually in charge. And that's such a powerful thing.
In that clip, you heard in order Julie Nowak, Elke Arneson, Mark Reynolds, Marshall Saunders, Kaysen Mortensen Chown, a 16 year old high school student, Amani Thurman, a first year college student, and Ryan Hall, who had just completed a 4,000 mile bike tour to bring people together on climate change. Thank you for listening to today's show. Be sure to share Citizens Climate Radio with your friends. Just look for Citizens Climate Lobby on iTunes, Podbean, and Stitcher Radio. We are now also available on Northern Spirit Radio. Just visit northernspiritradio.org. Join us for ongoing discussion at Facebook at our Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups, Citizens Climate Radio. The show is written and produced by me, Peterson Toscano. We had audio technical assistance from Chris Pellucci and Eric Scott at Media Evolution and Chris Polo Bloom. Other technical support from Ricky Bradley. Social media assistance from Ashley Hunt Mortarano, Flannery Keck, and Steve Volk. Moral support from Madeline Perra. All of the music we use on the show is licensed, unless otherwise specified. Special music for the Art House segment includes one suite from the free 1920s collection on archive.org. Visit citizensclimatelobby.org slash blog to see info about our puzzler and find links to our guests. An easy way to share the show is to get a link to it over at ccl.podbean.com. On the right, you will see Citizens Climate Radio listed under Categories. That's ccl.podbean.com. Bean, like lima bean, which I actually like with pesto. (laughs) Citizens Climate Radio is a project of Citizens Climate Education.